go ahead and get started. It's 730 p.m. May the 10th, 2022. Appreciate those of you who will be a part of this study of God's Word on tonight. Do a little house cleaning. Just let you know if you're not talking, I'm going to ask you if you would mute your mic. There will be an opportunity given to all of us for questions and answers and also comments. I want to encourage you to jot down some things that you would like to say after our discussion on tonight. I am going to begin tonight in Matthew chapter 19. I'm just going to read quickly verses 1 through 12 in just a few moments. Matthew 19, 1 through 12. But tonight's subject is not going to solely evolve around Matthew 19. I want to deal with the subject of what should our kids see in marriage. But I do want to read Matthew 19, 1 through 12 just to get us a running start on tonight. Before we begin, if you would, pray with me, please. Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for another opportunity that you've given us, first of all, to petition your throne through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanking you, Father, for another opportunity to study your word and learn some things, Father, that will help us to be better kingdom men, women, children, marriages, and families, dear God. We understand that life is all about you being lived here on this earth, letting God be seen in our lives, and, Father, denying the flesh and walking by the Spirit. We pray that this study will be one that is fruitful, beneficial to each and every one who took time out of their schedules to make it what it will be on tonight. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Matthew 19. I'm going to read 1 through 12 real quickly. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came on him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committed adultery. And whosoever marry her which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples said unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it's not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which are so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there are be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He says, He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. You know, I wanted to read those past scriptures of tonight because I wanted us to look at uh, these verses because if they don't tell us nothing, they tell us this, that, you know, marriage is hard. Marriage is work. Uh, marriage is tough. Marriage has been a problem even from the time that we read it uh, in Moses' day all the way through through Jesus' day. And so what we have to work on and what we're doing here on this Zoom study is working on, you know, life after the wedding, you know, life after the honeymoon. Because I believe many uh, people spend so much time and efforts and focus on the wedding and the and the honeymoon and not preparing for what comes after the wedding and the honeymoon. And uh, this is what we want to work on, kingdom marriages. You know, our children, if you are on here and you have children, you know, they are constantly watching those of us who are parents. And one thing we know is that they imitate our behavior. You know, each day that you and I live, what we're doing, we're providing our children uh, with uh, a model of behavior uh, and hopefully we want to pass down to them that they can apply to their lives as they they get older. And that's true even in marriage. You know, your children and my children, those who have them, they are watching how we conduct ourselves in our marriage. Husbands, how we treat our wives and wives, how we how we treat our our husbands. Understand that 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 marriage is something that's instituted by God. Marriage was instituted by God. It's a relationship that God monitors. God is very aware uh, when people get married, and he's very aware of people who are not married and who are practicing uh, what the Bible calls fornication. And God expects 
uh, husbands and wives uh, who are married to live righteous lives. You know, I believe this is one of the reasons why the father uh, entrusted his son, Jesus, to Joseph and Mary. Because those two individuals, married couples, they were, in fact, righteous people. And so tonight, what I want to do is I want to talk about what kind of marriage model uh, should we be giving our children? For those of us on here who are married and who have children, you know, what does God expect you and I who are married who have children? What does he expect for us, from us, to show our children in marriage, okay? First thing, I'm going to give you four quick things and then the lesson is yours. The first thing I believe we ought to be showing our children is uh, a, a, a married couple that truly loves God. I think our children need to see two Christians, if you're in a Christian home, who truly love the Lord with all their heart, with all their mind, and with all their soul. In Matthew 22, in verse number 37, Matthew 22 and verse number 37, Jesus said unto them, here's the idea, you shall love the Lord your God, how? With all your heart, with all your soul, and he said, as with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And so, you know, we need as, as parents to understand our responsibility in the marriage is discipleship. Discipleship. We are teaching our children in how we communicate with one another, husband and wife, and we're also teaching our children in how much we love the Lord when we're taking time out to sit down and discuss God's word with them. Our children need to see that. They need to see discipleship in the home. They need to see parents who, who if they say they love the Lord, who are going to sit down and have Bible discussions with their children. Deuteronomy, we talked about this a few weeks ago, right? Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, under the law of Moses, uh, Moses gives instructions to the children of Israel prior to them going into the promised land. In verse number 4, he tells them this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them, get this, verse 7, Deuteronomy 6, 7, teach them diligently unto your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the posts of your house and on your gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall brought you into the land which he swore unto your father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you great and goodly cities which thou build not, houses full of all good things which you fill it not, and wells dig which you dig not, vineyards and lawless trees which you planted not, when you shall have eaten and good full, then beware lest you forget the Lord. And so the idea is discipleship. Teach your children. Teach your children about God. That's exactly what Timothy's uh, mother and grandmother did for him. When you look in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and you know, Timothy became a great man of God, a great helper of, of Paul. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, where did, where did Timothy get all this information uh, from? Well, 2 Timothy 1, 5, Paul says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in you also, Paul said. So Paul knew about uh, Timothy's mother and his grandmother, how they taught him God's word, which is why Timothy was able to be the man that he was that we can read about in the scripture. Let me say this. We can't expect our children to take our Christian life serious if we're not living it. Make sure we get that. We cannot expect them to take our Christian walk serious if we're not living what we're teaching. And so as parents, we've got to do our part in instilling discipleship into our children. And that's what I believe God wants every kingdom marriage to do who have children. Secondly, secondly, they need to see that the husband and wife are committed. They need to see commitment. They need to see that you're committed to your spouse. We just read Matthew 19.1. And verse 1 through 9. You know, this whole chapter at the end of the day is really about commitment. You know, they're asking about divorce. And 
the Pharisees are. What they're trying to do, they're not asking for right reasons, not as though they care. They're really trying to trap Jesus in between what the law of Moses says and what he's going to say. But if anything Matthew 19 teaches, it teaches us that God, from the very beginning, expected committed marriages. He expected when people go into the marriage that you go into it with commitment. That means until death do you part. Romans chapter 7 kind of talks about that. Even uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Romans 7, 1 through 3. Paul says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law have dominion over man as long as he liveth, for the woman which have the husband is bound by the law of her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married uh, to another. And so people have to understand when, if you're not, if you're only you're not married, when you go into a marriage relationship, you need to go into it with commitment. And those who are married, you need to be committed to your significant other, to your spouse. You got to understand, you're in this for the long haul. Divorce, it really ought to be on the, it ought to be on the top shelf. I'm gonna just say that. Again, you know, sometimes we know sin now is in the world. Uh, again, uh, we know that there are some people that just simply won't do right, and so there are reasons uh, for divorce uh, sometimes. But I don't believe it ought to be a reason uh, that you go into a marriage thinking that it's going to fail. You are not going to a marriage with the mindset that if it doesn't go your way uh, and, and, and you're not committed to the marriage, that then you'll just simply get a divorce, okay? Thirdly, thirdly, uh, what the children need to see also in marriages is, is romance, uh, uh, romantic love from from the from the from their parents. You know, they need to they need to see. Now again, I'm not talking feel. I mean, you know, I shouldn't even say feel. I'm not talking. You know, uh, but hugs and kisses is what I'm talking about. They ought to see some affection uh, that is shown between a male uh, and a female, a husband and a wife, a mom and a dad in a in a marital relationship okay uh, they need to see that mom uh is committed to, to to their dad and dad really loves he really loves uh his wife proverbs chapter 5 the wise man solomon proverbs chapter 5. you know it's a shame that you know sometimes yeah you know, there are some households where children are growing up and they don't see this intoxicated love that uh that their mom and their dad should have one toward another you know they'll see it on tv hear it in the songs that they they hear on the radio but we got to get out of as parents you know being bashful and talking to our kids and you'll know when the time is right you know about about sex i mean and, and, and about love and and let them know that this is what god approves of and this can be done in the confines of, of marriage. And you need to teach your children that. Don't leave that up to the school systems and don't leave it up to the world or, or rap music to teach your children uh, how a uh, husband and wife should love each other and be romantic. Proverbs chapter five, beginning at verse 15. Solomon says, drink waters out of your own cistern and running waters out of your own well. Let your fountain be dispersed. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thy own, and not strangers with thee. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice. Get this, verse eighteen, with the wife of you. Let her be as the loving hind in the pleasant robe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. And why would thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? You see that word ravished there? That means intoxicated. Why would you be, why would you, your love be intoxicated for another woman? You're married. Your love, your intoxication should be to your spouse. And I think every parent needs to teach their children that. Every father teach your son. Every mother teach your daughter. We've talked about this before. You know, save yourself, you know, uh, until you're married. You know, you're not 
uh, more of a man, young men, because you slept around uh, with the whole community. That doesn't make that, that, that that's worldly mentality. And, and, uh, and vice versa, women, you know, love yourself, save yourself for your husband. And that needs to be taught in the marriage. Parents need to make sure they teach their children and show romance uh, uh, to each other. Hug and kiss. They ought to hear parents compliment each other. You know, compliment. I always fussing about the bills and the grades and everything else. How about letting your children hear you compliment your, your spouse, okay? And then finally, 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 our children need to see Jesus in the marriage. You know, marriages are designed are designed to represent Jesus, to reflect Jesus in our life. And that's what Paul is teaching in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. We'll read this. Very familiar passage of Scripture. We'll go there, and then we'll wrap this up, and I'll take any questions. Ephesians chapter 5. Marriages are designed to see Jesus. Matthew 5, 22. Matthew 5, 22. He says, Why submit yourselves to your own husband as unto the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. Now remember, that's marriage terminology he just used there. But this calls, look at verse 31, shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. So notice how Paul uses the marriage relationship to reflect the relationship between uh, the church and Christ. He said, this is a great mystery, verse 32, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is what children need to see and ought to see in the marriage. They should see the love of Jesus. They should see their parents loving each other like Jesus wants them to love. You know, at the end of the day, what our children need to see is sacrifice, godly leadership, submission, humility, patience, gentleness, reverence, kindness and forgiveness that's what they need to see in marriages in homes they should see how wonderful and blessed marriage really is instead of what the world is teaching uh, i'm gonna tell you mary uh, the world makes marriage seem like it's bad and, you know it's taboo you know but i'm gonna tell you marriage can be good when you and i do what God has told us to do when we act in ways that God wants us to act. You know what that means? That means you can't be selfish. This has got to be, it's got to be, it is, remember, this is the first thing God created. You know, before there was a, a father and a mother, there was a husband and a wife. You know, I want you to get this. This is the cornerstone of society, the marriage. But it was a marriage, then there was a, there was a children, then a, a community, a family, a community, a city. But it all starts from this cornerstone of marriage because this is the Lord's plan. So we want our children, if we want our children to please God someday, all I'm saying is we got to show them how to please God in our marriages today. If we want our children to grow up and please God in marriages uh, in the future, then we need to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to today, okay? Any questions or comments or thoughts? Any questions, comments, or thoughts, brothers and sisters? Even if it doesn't pertain to our subject matter tonight. Any questions? Yeah, I, I got a comment uh, to, your, to your number three when you uh, reference showing, you know, romance and whatnot to your, your, uh, your uh, wife. Uh, it's a good example because my experience you know i never even seen my parents kiss nothing wow. and and when you uh grow up that way you seek females so then you become i was a womanizer all that yeah so it's very important that you yeah. show how to love 
right. in, that, in that aspect. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank That's you, absolutely Nick. right. And thank you for your honesty, brother. Yeah, God bless you, my brother. And uh, yeah, and I appreciate that. And that, that definitely it, it needs to be it needs to be shown. It needs to be seen. It needs to be seen in the confines of marriage. You know, and, and, and it's not something that should be seen on, on in pornography and in, in these Playboy magazines, you know, and whatever else they got out there on, on this TV, on a lot of these TV shows. Foolish is these soap operas. We need to be teaching our children in the home. You know, this is where romance is to take place. And here are some aspects of it. Hug, kiss, wife and husband. And that's what that's our responsibility to teach them. Any question, Brother Green? Yeah, a great lesson to start off saying. Thank you, Brother Green. Said. And, and I was also thinking, you know, with, with you made the comment about allowing the world to show our children. Because, you know, you got all these reality shows on here, these basketball wives and these, all this other stuff that they got on here. And you see how these men and women interact with each other. So that's, that's supposed to be husband and wives and it's just one of the poorest examples because all you see is like a lot of cheating and fighting and arguing and then you know because I think um, and please help me with this uh, I think that not only should it be shown in the marriage but you should also show it to other people as well so you know your children will know how to interact and to treat other people as well you know, because you, you see all this stuff going on on TV, these people, they, they fight and, and, and call each other every dirty name they can think of and so on and so forth. So because I'm a firm believer that, you know, the teaching starts at home with the children, you know, that the parents would be the first teachers that their children have. And you're absolutely right, because I can think of my daughter when she was coming up and little things that, you know, like little goofy things I would do, you know, playing with my wife or whatever, and she'll come right behind me and imitate it, you know. <laughs> so I, you're right about that. So we always have to put that best foot forward and give good examples to our children because they will imitate, even if, you know, if you're teaching your child the wrong thing, you know, like you, you have some parents that have kids and, here it is, as soon as the child starts talking, they're using cuss words. And then you all you laugh and giggle at it and you think that it's cute. But then when that child gets to school, gets older and gets to school and use those same words to that teacher, now you're ready to beat the skin off of it. Right. Yeah. You know, exactly. and, and you're not realizing that they learned that at home with you. You know, so I think exactly. that it, it has to be a good example, not just a good example, but a godly example all the way around because we also have to remember when the kids do get up age, they do leave out the house. They're not around you 24 or 7. And we should have those examples that, you know, we teach our children to wherever they go they take those Amen. Thank you for that, Brother Green. And you all you all notice I didn't go to chapter six of Ephesians five. You do it at your own leisure. But once Paul gets through talking about the marriage there, and uh he goes right into talking about the children. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. And so he gets right out of talking about the marriage and then he goes right in talking about the children in chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And see, a lot of times, and I, to Brother Green's point, the reason our society is in the situation it's in is, you know, not always the case, but primarily, I mean, it starts at home. I, I, parents are the children's first line of authority that they see. This is why God says, you know, that they are to obey because it's the first command with the promise. You know, the idea is if you're not going to respect your parents, then you ain't going to respect nobody. You know, your parents loved you first before, you know, that your mom and she was there, your parents, you didn't love them first. They loved you first. They changed your life. They provided for you. They brought you into the world. And so you get you get of age and you disrespect your parents. And I, I said this uh, this past Sunday, it doesn't matter what age you are, you should always uh, honor your parents. You, you 50, 60 years old. If your mama's asking you to do something that's that doesn't violate 
you know, God's law, then you, you don't talk about law, mama, get it yourself. Or I'm talking, no, mama, okay, mama, I'm going to go get it. You know, you do what you can. You honor your parents as long as they live. That's what you do. Uh, but the idea of children disrespect that authority, it's no wonder why. You know, they disrespect the cops, the teachers, and, and everybody else. And, and, and have no respect for any line of authority. And so you just got to make sure we do our part. That's all. That's what we're here to do, represent Christ to the best of our ability. There are some parents that have done that, and kids still act for a while. Uh, but nonetheless, if you've done all you can do, then, you know, let the chip fall where they where they may. Okay? Uh, Steve and Bernadette, I see your hand. Oh, no. Thank you, brother. Uh, I guess I was uh, always contemplating on this subject uh, I know that my wife and I had very tumultuous years, uh, beginning at the beginning of our marriage and on through uh, for the long time that we've been married. And we came to an understanding that one of the biggest issues is that we never had the models. Uh, too many of us uh, as uh, uh, black children grew up in single homes. I grew up without a father. She grew up without a father in her home. And the attack on the family was the first thing that Satan did. The attack on the black family uh, was one of the first things that the slave masters did, because the family has always been the key. And when we don't have those models, we start at a deficit, and then we begin turning on each other. And that flows through the kids, and that has flowed into society. And uh, it's, it, it's very disheartening. So when you come to the knowledge of the truth and understand that, then we're trying to fix years, decades, <laughs> centuries of damage that the devil has done. And we can only do that one by one. I had to start when I had a child to make the decision that I was not going to be like my father to make sure that I was going to be there. And I didn't realize that I couldn't do that without God's help for many years. So it was good to come to that realization, but it's just the deficit that we start out with is so overwhelming. So when we come into that knowledge, we got to do everything we can. So when I come across other people, when we come across other young people uh, in the church or young brothers that may need mentorship or need those examples that we never got to try to build strong families now, it becomes so very important. And it's, uh, it just, uh, it's, it just, it rings very true, and it's, it's always just a very daunting task. I appreciate you bringing it up. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate the comment. Thank you so much. Uh, Brother uh, Mr. Grover? Yes, sir. Yes, you know, me, my mom, and uh, my auntie, and uh, my mom took in two other people. We went from house to house to house to house. My mom was dad and mom, and uh, she made me the strongest person i went to the military and i made it through 20 years because of my mom but she's a strong person and everything she's still my mentor and everything and it only takes one parent but it's good to have two but you're the strong one oh so, yeah she's staying on my behind and I graduated with honors at John L. LaFleur <laughs> High School, Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, that's wonderful, Mr. Grover. Mr. Grover, let me ask you just real quickly, uh, how, how did you hear about this Zoom study? Brother Lewis. Oh, Brother Lewis. You're a friend of Brother Lewis. Yeah, wonderful. Safe. Brother Lewis yeah. is a great, a great guy. He's a great brother, uh, he and his family. And, oh, uh, yeah. I'm so, so glad he invited you. Uh, uh, to this uh, this Zoom study, and uh, like I said, if you have any questions, I definitely uh, we want to entertain any questions because you did mention to me that you were you were you were Methodist, is that right? You go to Methodist church? Yes, sir. Yeah, Methodist church. So we we'll have to. I want, I'd like to sit down and, and and or maybe we can talk about about that someday too about the Methodist church and and about salvation. So maybe we can do that here uh, in the near future. Get with myself, brother Lewis. Because you know, I always had that question about Methodists. Do we even, is that is that a, an organization that you even see in the Bible, Methodists? I'm not, but at the same, you? um, the stuff we go through, through the yes, Bible, sir. it just like any other 
you know, organization within, I mean, any den denomination. My, he, you know, he preached uh, within the Bible. Yeah. I used to be Baptist, but my wife, she's Methodist. Wife is Methodist. Okay. Yeah. Be um, okay. But yeah. I just, when I follow through the Bible, that's when good. He, when he preached and I looked through it. Amen. But, hey, the denominations, to me, it's just mankind words. Right, they are. Yeah, denomination. Well, that's what denomination is, Mr. Grover. It's, it's, it's actually man made organizations. But on one thing I want to leave, and I want you to write this down real quick, and I'm not going to spend much, but I want you to write down for me Matthew 16. Okay. And I want Matthew 16 and 16. And because I, and the reason I want you to write that scripture down, and we'll talk later, but I want to write that scripture down because I want you to remember Jesus said he was going to build a church. I don't know if you ever read that before, but Jesus promised he was going to build a church. So I want you to write Matthew 16, 16 down and then write down Acts chapter two for me and mm -hmm. verse 36 through 47. Just write those verses uh, down for me. Because brother, hear me. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. No, no, my bad for butting in there. I think you meant to tell them, but 16, 18. Yeah, Matthew chapter 16. Yeah, okay. 16 through 18. Thank you, my brother. 16 through 18. Thank you for that, brother Jerry. Matthew 16, 16 through 18. Yeah, and in Acts 2, 36 through 47. And uh, we'll look at that because Jesus did say he was going to build a church. And we want to see, did he build a church? And we're going to find out what he meant when, when, when he said that, okay? Appreciate you, uh, your, your time, though, Mr. Grover. Thank you for being on here. Does anybody have any other questions, any comments, any thoughts? Yeah, Brother Coffee. In, in Matthew um, 19 and verse number 7, was Jesus referencing Deuteronomy 24? or anywhere within those confines of those scriptures yeah that's exactly what he was uh in, because remember that's what they said unto him they're saying unto him why did moses then command to give a right to, to put her away so these pharisees knew deuteronomy 24 and verse 1. that's what they're asking they're asking jesus but remember when they first asked jesus about this you gotta understand they're coming to jesus because they're tempting him and you'll know that based upon mark chapter 10. But what Jesus does, Jesus takes us all the way back to creation from the beginning. He takes it all the way back to God's original plan before sin entered into the world. See, this is what our brethren can, can't grasp, that sin is now in the world. That's what they cannot grasp. So people do get divorced. People are not going to do right because sin, everybody's not going to do right because sin is in the world. There are some people who can care less about what God's word says. But Jesus takes them back all the way to God's original plan for man and woman. So by the time Exodus gets here, Moses gets on scene, we know sin is already in the world. Adam and Eve broke both, ate from the tree that they should not have eaten from. And so the law of Moses provided a way for people to get a divorce and by putting a written divorce in, in a person's hand, and then they could go out and marry somebody else. Okay, and, and uh, but here's the thing: it would still be called adultery if you got a divorce for a reason other than fornication. That's what the law says. And, and so as long as that person, if you got a divorce and you married somebody else, but as long as that person that you divorce is alive, you are still called an adulterer. You're you're an adulterer. Even under the law of Moses, but the, it, it never said that they couldn't go marry somebody else as our brother and teach today. A person who got caught fornicating under the law of Moses, you give them a divorce, they can go out and marry somebody else. Jesus is not changing the law. He's explaining the law. Just like he would say, if you kill anybody and you shot him in the head, you're a murderer. That's what the law said. That doesn't change it. You're, you're a murderer. You took a man's life because because you just didn't like him. The Bible explains what that is. The law says you're a murderer. And that's all Jesus explained. But can you get forgiveness for that? Surely you can. Paul was a murderer. Moses was a murderer. David was a murderer. David was an adulterer. But they all got forgiveness when they came to God with godly sorrow. Okay? I saw Brother Coffee. Wait, Brother Coffee. 
Okay, now there, there must be two laws because recall in John chapter 8, when the woman was caught in the act of adultery, uh, wasn't the law that they were to be stoned to death in that situation or no? Yeah. Okay. The law, yeah, the law, the law would say that the penalty for the adultery was to be was to be stoned. They're, they're caught in the act of adultery, and so the law, the law says here to stone. So I, I see what you're saying. You're saying so if they were caught in a see, remember this. Now remember Joseph. Mary's pregnant. What is Joseph going to do though? See, remember, you don't have to. You, you, every case is different. Joseph could have made a public example out of it, which he, which he was a righteous man. He said, I'm not going to do that. He's not going to take her before the people so she could be stoned. So what is he going to do? I'm just going to divorce her. I'm going to divorce her privately. That was, that was his choice to do that. Now, he could have brought her before the law and, and before the people. They made a decision. And, and God could have, I mean, they could have even cast lots uh, like they did with the man that's picking up sticks. There's a man picking up sticks, violating the Sabbath. They didn't know what to do with him. Moses said, number 15, put him in jail till the Lord tell you what to do with him. And they ended up killing that man because God said to kill him. And so the idea is they had various ways and things that the priests had to do to determine under the law whether or not a person was guilty. When you go look at the laws, you know, women who 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 did this, there were certain things they would drink, and if they swole up, their body swole up a certain way, they would know they were guilty, and then they would have that woman kill. You would know she was guilty. If this didn't happen when she drank a certain thing, uh, God's letting you know that well, she's not guilty. So, you know, of, of fornicating or for for the reason your your husband is jealous, then you don't do anything to her. So what Joseph was going to do is just put her away privately, you know, instead of taking her to law, have her stoned. And so, and, and, and he, that was his, his right to do that. And, and but if he, yeah, but he, but he fought me. He, but he, he knew he didn't have a pregnant. He knows she's pregnant. He knows it wasn't from him. And so, what he's going to do is just put her away privately because he's a righteous man. He don't want to have her stone, even though you know. And but the Holy Spirit talked. I mean, the angel talked to him. Said Joseph, here not to take that that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And, and so that lady in John 8, here's the thing, Brother Crawford, the lady in John 8, uh, she's brought to Jesus instead of being brought to the, the people she could have been brought to, the, to figure out what to do with her. They're bringing her to Jesus for the purpose of just simply tempting Jesus to see what he's going to do. But Jesus, knowing their heart, what Jesus does is he gives her forgiveness. Are, are there any accusers? Remember what they said to him, cast the first stone. Remember what they're saying? Cast the first, because the law for adultery is a stone. But what he's giving her is mercy. It goes back to what you said, because you said that sin was already in the world. Yeah, so, sin is now in the world. Yeah. yeah, sin is in the world after Adam and Eve, you know, after they did what they did. Sin is now in, into the world. And so what the law, here's the purpose of law, brothers. Law is a schoolmaster. To show us we need Christ. Make sure you get that. The law, all it does is cut you. Hmm. Hmm. It cuts all of us. Cut. You see, and it cuts you. So what do you have to do? I need Christ. Schoolmaster, bring me to Christ. That's all. That's what the purpose of the law was. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so what we're seeing under the law of Moses, by giving her a writing of divorcement, we're seeing, you're even seeing mercy under the law of Moses. God provided a way for mercy. This woman cheated. Uh, her husband found some uncleanness in her. This is what you can do. Give her a writing of divorcement. Give her a writing of divorcement and let her go marry somebody else. And she'll still be labeled an adultery. Great question, brother. Yeah, but there's all. There's only one law, though. There is There is only one law. Okay, one law. David should have been stoned, brother, uh, brother uh, Carlson. David, by law, for what he did, death. Because remember, the wages of sin is death. Amen. Brother Jerry. Your mic's on, Brother Jerry. Yeah, yeah I believe I, I'm going to just be my last time asking. No, you're okay. Oh, all right. Because I'm really wanting to get this. So I'm here when, okay. when you saying when, when you saying like the law labels you and adultery. But, you know, our brethren, they'll say that since the law labels you that you got to come about it, and that don't mean you still continually to be in that marriage, adulterous marriage. 
See, that's what's the buzz of towards that. Okay. Let's let and, and keep asking until you get it, brother uh, Jared. I want you to ask it until you get it and you know it and you know you know for yourself. Go to Romans seven. All keep right. asking, brother. I want you to get it. I want you to understand it for yourself. These brothers that that that, that teach this, I'm gonna tell you what they're doing, brother. And I know it's hard. You understand? They are making marriage sin. Make sure you get that. They are making marriage sin. You got to get that first. You got to get, okay, marriage is not sin. Marriage is not sin. So now what are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with what caused the adultery. What caused it to be adultery now? What caused it to be adultery now is the reason the first marriage was severed. The reason, see, Brother, brother Jerry, if, if a person left a spouse, I want you to get this. I want you to think about this. She did nothing wrong. And vice versa, he did nothing wrong. Whoever, either one of them marry after that, they're both adulterers. I want to make sure you get it. I want that to sink in because this might help. You, neither one of y'all did, did, did cheat. Y'all just don't break up for what they call irreconcilable differences. Just to say people do that. People do do that. They go their separate ways. Down the line, he finds somebody else. She finds somebody else. Guess what they are when they get married? By law, an adulterer. Why? But what made them an adulterer? What made them an adulterer is the reason their first marriage was severed. Now, if one cheated, and you get this, one cheated, the other one didn't. The one that cheated, the one that didn't cheat, put them away. Because they're the one that cheated. Whoever that person married that didn't cheat, they're not an adulterer. Because they were not the cause of the divorce for fornication or stepping outside the marriage. I'm going to go as slow as I can because I do want you to get this, brother. And I mean, ask it a million times if you need to. So, yeah, I'm right. Right. Okay. so now we go to Romans 7. Look what Romans 7 says. I'm going to read this again. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Now, those are Paul saying. What law is Paul talking about? I'm talking to those who know the law of Moses. That's what he's talking about. How that the law has a dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Okay? As long as he liveth. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. Okay? So you got married. Law said till death do you part. That's what God's original plan was. One man, one woman for life. Okay? So he says you're bound by that. But if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. Now she's a widow, right? Husband died. She's a widow. Guess what she's loose from? That law of marriage. He's dead now. Dead to that law. So, now look what he says. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, get this, she shall be called. I know he doesn't say you can be married to another person. He doesn't say that. That's what they're saying. This scripture don't say that they can't be married to another person just because it's adult. See, our brother said, but it's adultery. How can you do it? That's what they, that's what they say. You're labeled an adulteress. But why are you labeled an adulteress? The reason because of why the first marriage severed. So so now this woman, her husband left her. She didn't do nothing wrong. He just left her. He found another woman. She wants to be married. She gets married to somebody that did nothing wrong. When does God ever hold a person who didn't do anything wrong in jeopardy? I want to make sure you think. I want you to think about this. My wife did nothing wrong. Begged me to stay. I left her. Why would God, and when have God ever made her suffer for it? But if she marries somebody else, she's an adulterer. But who caused it? This boy right here, me. I caused her to be an adulterer. This is what Jesus is teaching. Well, what made her an adulterer? Because it's God's law. It's supposed to be one man or one woman for life, and you just left her. 
You see what I'm saying? So he says, she shall be called a daughter. But now get this. But then I die. I'm dead. But she's married to this other guy. But I'm dead now. Guess what she's dead to now? She's no longer, look what he said. But if her husband be dead, I'm gone now. Talking about the first man she's married to. She is free from that law. Do y'all know the reason why we're free from the law of Moses? You know why you're free from the law of Moses? And married to Christ, now we can be married to another? Because there was a death. Make sure we get that. That was a death that took place so that we can now be married to Christ. Amen. There's a death takes place. This is why we're married to Christ. He said, if her husband be there, she's free from the law so that she is no adulteress. Now get this. Though, get this. Though she be married to another. He didn't say she had to come out of that marriage. She's married to somebody else. She is going to be labeled on the door. Now somebody asks her, are you an adulterer? No, you know what? Yeah, that guy I was with, you know, yeah, I was married. But he he's dead now. He, he dead. So God's law said, the law said you're no longer an adulterer. But she's already been forgiven mercy because God says it's better to marry than to burn. Marriage is not a sin. It's not good for man to be alone. I, I, I hope that helps a little bit. If not, brother, I want you to keep asking, brother Musgrove, because I, what's going to happen, brother Musgrove, you got these devils, these guys in the church from these schools. I know how hard, because this one, how can I do it if it's adultery? That's where the mercy, mercy, mercy. Understand this. Law can't save us, brothers and sisters. You and I, there's no law you and I keep that that merits us to get into heaven. All of us, at the end of the day, need mercy. Make sure you get that. Even those brothers who are teaching, no, you had your one chance at marriage. That's what they're teaching. You've you had your one chance. That's it. No mercy. But that's not what God teaches. You get married. Because it's better to marry than to burn. With passion. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? All right, brother. So I know it's been a long night, but this is what this is about. And uh, I, I love these studies. These are great studies. And uh, this is how we learn. Uh, just please understand. Mercy rejoice it at the judgment. We all need mercy. And uh, the wages of sin is death. Are there any prayer requests before we close out tonight? Any prayer requests? Any prayer requests? Okay. If not, uh, brother, uh, brother Nick, can you? I can see. Can you go ahead and take us up in a closing prayer for tonight, my brother, brother Nick? Yes, sir. Well, yes, sir. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for allowing us to gather together to. Uh, listen to your word to uh, try to become better in your eyes, Father, so that we can uh, venture down this narrow road, uh, Father, and we can uh, keep you yes. on, in our focus and just block out all these world, all the world, because we know that we are in this world, but we are not of this world, Father. Yes. I pray for uh, Brother Grover that uh, he'll be able to. Uh, uh, reach out to Brother Henry and Brother Lewis to expand his uh, knowledge of the Bible, Lord, and that uh, he can uh, keep coming on here to learn and to uh, broaden his horizons to understand yes. that we are children of God and that he needs to be studying to show himself approved, Father. I just thank you for every brother on here, whatever they're going through, brother and sister going through, yes. that uh, you'll watch over them, you'll You'll, you'll be with them, Father, as we get off of this Zoom call. Forgive us for our sins, Father, and I pray this in your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Nick. Thank you, Brother and Sister. Remember, our next Zoom study will be Thursday at 7 o'clock on Brother Green's Zoom page, okay? Brother Green's Zoom page, and we are in the book of Nehemiah uh, chapter 12, okay? Nehemiah chapter 12. And, uh, and hopefully we'll see you all at the next appointed time. Uh, we'll leave all the faithful saints of God with Romans 16, 16. Salute one another with the holy kiss. The church of Christ salutes you. Good night, everybody.